Benchmark numbers, though, are not sufficient. You'll see in this case, the performance on benchmarks even better than that versus competition. Latest gen competitive products compared to competition over competition versus Renoir, comp. All the competition in the competition, competition, nearest competitor, all the competition. The AMD 4800U is on the left, the Intel 11th gen platform is on the right. Over the Ryzen 4800U, Ryzen 4800U system versus AMD's 4800U. AMD 4800U system. The AMD 4800U is on the left and the Intel 11th gen core system is on the right. But of course we need to be aware of our competition. AMD 4800U Renoir is AMD's current fastest integrated graphics in the U series. Today, Intel announced its new R7 4800U CPU, which it compared against 11th gen parts from the competition. During its presentation, Intel's 4800U... AMD. What's up? Uh, AMD makes the 4800U. AMD. AMD makes the 4800U? Yeah. Why is Intel talking about it so much? So apparently AMD makes the 4800U, but that didn't stop Intel from talking about it a whole lot today in its presentation. Intel got everybody on the edge of their seat when it sent out a promissory note of, quote, something big is coming, and that was for September 2nd. So everyone waited for a few months, and with dozens of news articles writing about Intel's plans for something big happening in September, we now know what it was following Nvidia's bombastic announcements that dominated the media yesterday. Intel now has something to say, and that is that it has a new logo and a new jingle. Uh, but there's also one other thing it had to say. Unlike our imitators using benchmarks like Cinebench, which has a really niche usefulness in real life, we set for ourselves a higher bar to ensure we are really the best across industry benchmarks. There we go. That, that sounds like Intel. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly's Conductonaut Liquid Metal. Conductonaut is what we've used in all of our liquid metal and D-lit thermal tests, capable of dropping CPU thermals significantly when replacing the stock thermal interface. Lower CPU thermals don't just allow better overclocks, but also lower noise levels because the transfer efficiency is increased. The mix of gallium and indium makes for a thermal conductivity of 73 watts per meter Kelvin, outclassing traditional pastes significantly. Learn more at the link in the description below. So the most frustrating thing about Intel's event today was that it has what looks to be an actually promising product, which is its new laptop silicon, its CPU and GPU silicon for mobile devices. It might actually make an impact where AMD has only recently established a new foothold in the laptop market. This is especially important for both companies because the laptop marketplace is a wider mainstream market that has uh, much greater potential for product sales than just DIY enthusiasts, for example. And it's something that AMD has really struggled to get into until recently. Now that AMD has gotten into laptop distribution, it is also entering into the OEM's lists of a brand with some credibility, someone they can trust to work with for their products and not make the ultimate seller of it, HP, Dell, whomever, look bad for selling the product. So Andy's really established a strong foothold here. And Intel coming out with an actually competitive CPU, if only we knew the name of it. Intel, as far as we could count, only actually fully named one of its new CPUs once. We even made a chart. This is our attempt at a real world benchmark, just like Intel wanted. In our real-world benchmark, spanning one hour and 14 minutes of its video footage, Intel said AMD 12 times by our count, it said 4800U 8 times, and it said competition and conjugations or derivatives thereof 27 times, which is a 2600% increase over the amount of references to a full Intel 11th gen CPU name. We still don't know most of the names, because Intel conceded its own names are terrible and resigned to calling them 11th gen or Tiger Lake. That'd be like if AMD only ever called its CPUs Matisse, instead of constantly saying the name of the thing you actually buy. For quick reference, we also benchmarked NVIDIA's keynote as a control. By our count, NVIDIA referenced 37, 3080, and 3090 18 total times. Pascal got 9 references for the previous gen, and 2080 and 2080 Ti got a total of 5 references. It had 0 references to AMD, AMD products, Intel, or Intel products. So there you go. There's your real world benchmarks of marketing and branding. But Intel has a chance here to really hurt AMD in that newly claimed segment. Because the numbers that they're putting up do look compelling. Uh, but ultimately, 
Intel is presenting its information in a way which makes the company look uh, inept at best or sleazy, maybe at worst. So we keep this this dead horse is it's pretty dead at this point. It's it's been dead in our set background for about a year now and still counting, but the dead horse can still take more beatings. And right now what Intel really needs to do is stop presenting things in such a way that just is fueled with bitterness and hatred towards its competitor and instead focus on its own damn product. If Intel has a product which is actually compelling and it seems like Tiger Lake is, which by the way, that's the name of the product we're talking about today. Intel didn't mention it a whole lot, but they did keep talking about AMD. But if they've got this thing that it can compete it's just you would never really know it because of how jealous Intel seems in its presentation. So Intel really pushed its we have something big, seriously announcement hard. It was actually genuinely difficult to find good coverage of the Intel event shortly afterward. There wasn't much out there. Most of the early coverage was from financial press and even mainstream media, like the big three-letter initialism media that defines the news for non-tech topics. And all of them primarily talked about Intel's new logo and its new design aesthetic. Intel had an upbeat video with typefaces and font choices and color palettes. It had a new cacophony of unpleasant brass for its iconic jingle, and the company did announce more, but it was hard to find. And unfortunately, the product announcements, again, were absolutely buried by the discussion about AMD's own products. So, Intel's something big was, we think, maybe, probably, the 11th gen Tiger Lake CPUs. We were expecting a little bit, all that hype, we are expecting a little bit more, but that appears to be what they were talking about. Uh, Intel, however, seemed to have trouble remembering its own product name. The AMD 4800U is on the left, and the Intel 11th gen platform is on the right. So that was part of the presentation, and despite stammering with the product name, pausing just long enough for those of us who have to stand on camera all the time and remember product names to recognize the difficulty, Intel then moved on to show what actually looks to be potentially competitive performance, but it did so after conceding to the name 11th gen instead of, what was it? It was like i7-1185G7, and just wait till later in the presentation where they show the power consumption and power limits next to that. So then you get the Intel i7-1185G7 or whatever it was for that part, 1.5 WPL1 or 15 watts power, power limit one. Either way though, the claims in this part were that it is quote, two times as fast as the 4800U in video rendering with QuickSync. This uh, two times as fast uh, nomenclature is something that all three of the big silicon companies use. It's always a bit of an odd marketing metric because from a benchmark presentation standpoint, the phrasing two times as fast doesn't really mean anything but their intent is it takes half as long. But you could also use multiplication, I guess, if you're not gonna actually do any math to make the numbers work. But anyway, you can't accelerate two times against an arbitrary scale in a direction which is, is negative is kind of what we're getting at. But that's okay. So we've seen similar IGP performance improvements in rendering in the past. QuickSync is not new. Intel does in fact have a genuine real advantage, or at least it did until Premiere started working on the APU side of things for AMD in rendering and in working with uh, Adobe software to accelerate the actions that can make use of an IGP. Now, in some of our prior testing from ages past, we have found many scenarios in complex software like Adobe Premiere, where the IGP isn't universally leveraged to quite this extent. It's sort of like how the common comment right now for RTX cards is about NVIDIA's own marketing claims, how the 3080 is quote, 100% faster in some specific applications that people have cherry-picked than the 2080. It's a scenario that you can make happen, but it doesn't mean it's universally true. And the same goes for IGP usage in things like Adobe Premiere. You can absolutely make that scenario happen uh, where it is significantly faster, and it's great when it works. But we've switched off of CPUs with IGPs in them because they just weren't good enough for our workloads. And it's a really variable mixed bag when it gets to video editing because there's so many things that you can do that each workload is going to behave a little bit differently. Intel is also claiming a time reduction of 27% in Photoshop subject selection and it is again obsessing over AMD in this comparison 
rather than showing us a comparison of Intel versus past Intel. Intel doesn't want to show how much it's improved against itself. It only wants to show how it's doing versus its newest competitor in the mobile market, AMD, which has been completely absent from it for years. And that's where it looks weak by Intel because AMD hasn't been in the mobile game for a really long time. It's not like desktop DIY or server where they instantly got out there in front of everyone with Ryzen. It took a little while longer for the laptop stuff to really start popping up in a way that meant something for AMD's products. So the fact that Intel is now recoiling from this just six months later from AMD's new presence in laptops looks like they've been hit a lot harder than perhaps they actually have been. And that's all because of the perception that Intel is creating with its overly defensive presentation where it can't stop talking about AMD's products in its own Intel product announcement presentation. Reflecting on our coverage approach to NVIDIA yesterday, we noticed that it was completely hardware and specs driven. We wanted to look back at how we covered NVIDIA because it felt like covering Intel was shaping up in a more critical and different way entirely, and we wanted to really figure out why it felt that way. And in reflecting on that coverage, we noticed one key thing. NVIDIA didn't mention AMD, at least that we could find once in the entire coverage, and certainly not in a way which was as deriding as Intel's mentions of AMD. Uh, NVIDIA did not this time, it's done it in the past, but didn't this time take unsubtle jabs at its competitor and instead focused on its own product and entirely on comparisons against its previous products. There was not one AMD GPU in those gaming uplift charts. However, uh, useless some of them may have been because of the odd decision to scale the y-axis on pixels, they still didn't show a competitor. So it was entirely marketed against itself. And that's where the, the difference really emerges. And then today we've got quotes from Intel uh, directly knocking AMD in a much more aggressive fashion. And we'll play that back again one more time. Unlike our imitators using benchmarks like Cinebench, which has a really niche usefulness in real life, we set for ourselves a higher bar to ensure we are really the best across industry benchmarks. So in this full quote, Intel is saying that it has ascended beyond benchmarks. It's moved into the greater plane where Apple resides, where things are built on magic and unicorns and single button mice, for example. And it has uh, moved on to realistic and real life presentations of how a product performs. It then says that it is setting a higher bar to be the best across industry bench, is that right? Industry benchmarks, it's weird. I thought they were just saying benchmarks were bad. Anyway, uh, they're trying to be the best across industry benchmarks, but also only imitators use benchmarks. Uh, further still, we would actually agree with Intel that Cinebench is of limited usefulness. We eliminated it from our officially published benchmarking suite many years ago. That's because we replaced it with things which represent a very similar type of workflow. The processor is leveraged almost the exact same way, except in a more widely used set of applications. Those applications and our benchmarks would include things like Blender, which is now used across the games industry, including by Epic Games, who is assisting in uh, promoting Blender in the very least lately. It's also used in cinema and in uh, 3D and animation workloads. So Blender is one of the ones we've replaced Cinebench with. We also added V-Ray by Chaos Group, and that one has grown in popularity over the years as well. So these are widely used. They are also benchmarks. If you can use them in such a fashion that one could call it a benchmark. Benchmarking is ultimately just the process of taking devices and comparing them to one another with some form of quantifiable data, some objective process that is repeatable and produces a useful number out the end of it. Intel is trying to stretch this phrase benchmark in a, a way that makes it seem like it is only for completely unrealistic synthetic scenarios. But in fact, benchmarks can be both synthetic and real world. So while Intel is busy yelling at pigeons about how many more soldiers its CPUs can draw, I need more soldiers. AMD has been working on producing Cinebench numbers. And although both of those are of limited usefulness for most people, the one thing we can extrapolate away here is that Cinebench is at least something you can compare across the platform. And more importantly, Cinebench is not that different from how Blender and V-Ray behave. 
So even if you're not a Cinema 4D user, which most people are not, Intel's 100% correct on that, uh, you may very well be a user of things that are tile-based rendering applications, and those would scale pretty similarly in general. Uh, further still, the bigger point here, before we can even get into product specs today, unfortunately, is Intel's name calling, uh, referring to AMD as imitators. This is just petty, and it looks weak and defensive. AMD did steal Intel's entire chipset and CPU naming convention. Fortunately, Intel has also, like it has with benchmarks, ascended past the use of names that are legible by humans and towards things like 11857G7, or whatever it was. Doesn't really matter. No one's gonna remember it anyway. So, years ago, AMD decided to steal Intel's chipset and CPU names because it uh, needed some way to communicate or convey to the market that this product matches that incumbent's product, Intel's product in this category. Uh, but until AMD goes back to 14 nanometers and starts adding pluses to the end of it, it's not really an imitator. And this is also dangerous glass house and stones territory to get into for Intel, where what happens the instant that Intel starts playing around with multi-chip modules, or glue, as they called it previously. Does that then make Intel the imitator of AMD? Uh, ultimately, they're both trying to sell a product, and we'd really like it if both companies would focus on selling their own damn product instead of throwing stones at the guy across the pond. The biggest oddity, though, is that in Intel's crusade for real-world performance, it is still showing things which are actually just quantifiable benchmarks. They're literally benchmarks. But Intel is trying to twist the words in a way where it doesn't quite seem like that. For example, when showing object selection performance or premier scrubbing performance, Intel is leaning heavily on the phrasing real world workloads, real life scenarios. Intel then produces numbers at the end of it after running a controlled set of, we'll call them tasks. That's a benchmark. So it's just, it's literally, that is, exactly what benchmarking is. That's the stuff we already do. And many other reviewers, by the way, are capable of running such tests. So blanket statements about, unlike some people who are using benchmarks, ugh, uh, we are beyond that. Intel is casting doubt on all controlled testing here. But what's actually happening is that Intel is refuting its own point to the nth degree about benchmarks being useless or benchmarks being inaccurate to real world performance and then it goes on and presents benchmarks and it talks about benchmarks and it talks about how it's trying to achieve the highest bar in benchmarking and get the highest real world performance benchmark results. So ultimately what's happening is Intel is tearing down its own brand credibility and damaging the trust that reviewers, that customers, that viewers who might not even want to buy the stuff but are just interested from afar, it damages the trust that all of these groups of people have in what Intel is saying. And that's a bad thing. Even just small examples like this chart from page four of its 100-plus uh, page slideshow, you can see AMD here offers a baseline 1.0 performance, while Intel offers plus 28%, plus 67%, and 4x. It's like, it's like, it seems intentional. Certainly, the new logo from Intel is all psychology-driven. So y you get this weird trying to tweak the numbers to such an extent that you're actually changing the decimal places and the multipliers and the units by which you are comparing things. 1.0 looks awfully small compared to plus 28%. Why, why not 100%, 128% if you're gonna do that comparison? Why not Intel versus Intel? Why don't we do that? If Intel does Intel new versus Intel old, how does it present that data? That's the real question for this one. Uh, 4X. Where does that come from? Why have we switched to a multiplier instead of percentages? And why not, why, why not like 4.0, 5.0, whatever, 1.28, whatever the case may be? That's enough ranting about Intel's terrible approach to a product presentation. We'll talk briefly about the actual product specs. Unfortunately, we were so busy pausing the video every 30 seconds that it, it became difficult to gauge how we should approach 
the content. So we decided to focus on the thing Intel needs to actually improve, which was all the stuff a second ago, and uh, then split the last bit for the actual announcements. This is Intel. You can learn a lot from the way NVIDIA is doing presentations. Don't learn from AMD. They actually do pretty, uh, pretty petty pe presentations as well. We wouldn't really recommend looking at them for guidance, but uh, that would make you an imitator anyway, so we wouldn't want that. So let's get into the real news, though. They have a lot of stuff to look at from block diagrams to technical information on volt frequency curves, things like that. That's all more architectural stuff. We are interested in it. But it's not going to be the focus today because the focus today was Intel's positioning in marketing. And now we're just going to look at the product spec sheets and information. So here's a block diagram of one of the processors. The new CPUs will scale up to four cores, eight threads at 4.8 gigahertz max for single thread and will include PCIe Gen 4 support. The Gen 4 support is primarily useful for higher speed SSDs, but could potentially prove useful for GPU attachment. Uh, that said, the PCIe bandwidth differences should be relatively minor when it comes down to actual graphics throughput. But we'll have to test things and see how it goes. The more important difference is marketing, sadly. And having PCIe Gen 4 on the box will actually be meaningful for the less informed buyer. The graphics solution is branded as Iris XE in this block diagram and hosts 96 EUs at the fully built version. Power management includes updates to DVFS, which is just a uh, volt frequency scaler, pretty much all the modern processors do some form of DVFS. Uh, next up, here's the product spec sheet. Intel has moved beyond TDP, which is actually a good thing. And it spent a while tearing down TDP as a measurement of anything useful. So hopefully it removes that metric elsewhere too, if it really believes this. Instead, Intel is providing a power range, which we think is far better for especially its DIY enthusiast products if it goes this direction in the future. And it is showing the power saving CPUs operating in the 7 to 15 watt range and the higher end CPUs in the 12 to 28 watt range. This is actually an approach that we can get behind, assuming it's accurately tested, obviously, uh, and is a little bit less confusing for most people than TDP, where you have a short range and a long range power number that may or may not align with the TDP number. Although the Longer term, Tau Expiry 1 typically does align one to one with it. The CPUs are the i7 11885G7. We'll leave that mistake in there because it is a realistic benchmark. Intel's looking for real world scenarios to promote its products anyway. Normally we would cut a mistake like that and just re say it, but that was a genuine one. And at this point, it's probably a realistic thing to encounter. So the 1185G7 is at the top of the stack. It's four cores, eight threads. Intel has made its naming significantly more confusing, even beyond just those letters and numbers, though, because now its i3 CPUs are listed as four core, eight thread, or two core, four thread. The i5 CPUs run four core, eight, as do the i7s. And we also like that Intel has decided to list maximum all core turbo, and we'll give them credit for no longer shying away from that metric. The highest single core at 4.8 is noteworthy and is what will contribute meaningfully to Intel's ability to combat AMD in this space. The graphics cores also look significantly improved in a way which may finally move IGPs away from something like 720p games and into something actually useful. It's just a shame that after all this talk, all the architecture information, all the technical information, Intel decided that it was going to build a bigger story out of its name calling than its own product. The imitators statement was the one that really started, to, it really set the tone. That was at five minutes into the presentation. And that was the tone that we had for the entire rest of the presentation. Intel, when people are watching your presentations, and within five minutes, you call your competitor names and then go forth to contradict yourself several times, forget your own product name, and refer to the competitor's products so many times that I, a non-laptop CPU reviewer, learn the competitor's names before yours. That's not the way you should be presenting a product. This is a bad precedent to set, and uh, this, this could have all been very interesting and useful, and we would have been happy to cover the architectural information, as we often do. However, in this case, with an airtime that is generally limited to around 30 minutes, max for us at least, we decided that the more interesting story would be the one of how Intel manages to keep flubbing its delivery 
of new products even when they actually look competitive. When the product is good, you don't need to do screwy things to market it. Just market the damn product. How many times now have I had to get on camera and say this specifically about Intel or AMD? It's always those two most recently. NVIDIA absolutely with the RTX launch in 2018. We grilled them for that. But lately though, it, it, Intel has been on the receiving end of this discussion the most. Uh, AMD is starting to learn. It's hired some new people who believe in this approach, so that's good. Intel has people who believe in the approach. We're not sure what's happening, but it's such a big company that there's a lot being lost in the corporate mess. So anyway, we couldn't find a single instance uh, beyond the one of the full product name being called out. Most of the time it was truncated. And even if there's one more hidden in there somewhere that we didn't find, that's still like seven or eight 4800U full product name references to Intel's one, which is just silly. So. Uh, Intel, probably time to work on the names, probably time to work on the marketing, but the product stack is at least looking promising. This is a place where Intel can seriously recover from AMD. We would suspect that this should be something actually worth considering a purchase of, Tiger Lake that is, in the laptop and portable space, particularly for business use. So. Maybe we'll review one. Typically we don't, but who knows? We might look into them. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. You can watch the roundup of the NVIDIA news from yesterday as well if this stuff interests you. And uh, you can go to store.cameraspaccess.net if you'd like to pick up a wireframe mouse mat, mod mats, or other stuff from our store. We'll see you all next time.